Would you stand with me as we sing our hymn of the month one final time? In God we trust, in God alone. We pray for peace and plead for grace. We bow our knees in humbleness. We cry to God to heal our land. Forgive our sins and cleanse our hand. In God we trust, in God alone. We put our faith in him who sits on heaven's throne. Though man of earth will rise and fall, rest in God's control and honor those he put in power for hearts of kings are in his hand the nations turn at his command in God we trust in God alone we put our faith him who sits on heaven's throne. Though men of earth will rise and fall, our only hope is in the Lord of all. In God we trust, in God alone. Protect the weak, establish law. Honor the right, punish the wrong. Let this be true of those who lead. O men of faith, now intercede. In God we trust, in God alone. We put our faith in him who sits on heaven's and soon will come. Help me to stand if all alone. And though my life be may call for, God's kingdom is not of this earth. In God we trust, in God alone. We put our faith in him sits on heaven's throne. No man of earth will rise and fall. Our only hope is in the Lord of all. In God we trust. In God alone. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer tonight, shall we? Heavenly Father, it is in you and in you alone that we put our trust, and there is nothing and no one else that we can trust in for strength, for refuge, because you are in control, and as the song says, nations and kings will rise and fall, but you are the same yesterday, today, and forever as we heard this morning. I pray that you would help us to trust in you during these times, no matter what the future holds, because we know that you hold the future. I pray that you, uh, we pray for your blessing upon this service, this hour. Uh, be with those that could not be here with us and those who are uh, fighting the, pan uh, the virus of the pandemic and others fighting other physical needs. Um, I pray that you would uh, just give them grace and be with uh, Pastor Slutz as he speaks tonight. I pray this in Christ's name. Amen.
You may be seated. Once again, we're so glad to have you uh, at, our, at our service tonight, and uh, I trust you had a good uh, Thanksgiving. Uh, I know some people are maybe gone traveling and whatnot, and I know that in general the uh, numbers for the pandemic are going up, so we just want to encourage you to continue to stay safe and uh, maintain social distancing and washing your hands, all those good things that you learned about whenever you were in uh, kindergarten and whatnot. Uh, don't want to spread anything uh, to each other besides uh, our love for one another, uh, but we're thankful that you're here tonight. Our next song that we're going to sing is is Jesus Loves Even Me. And uh, as you think about that title, Jesus Loves Even Me, you may think to yourself, well, I'm pretty lovable. And then, uh, if you, but if we all really thought about it, we realize that when compared to, to Christ and our and, and in light of his holiness and our sin, it is amazing that Jesus loves even me. So we'll sing all three verses of this song. I am so glad that our Father in heaven tells of his love in the book he has given. Wonderful things in the Bible I see. This is the dearest that Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves even me. Though I forget him and wander astray, still he doth love me wherever I stray. Back to his dear loving arms would I flee when I remember that Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves even me. Oh, if there's only one song I can sing, when in his beauty I see the great King, this shall my song in eternity be. Oh, what a wonder that Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves even me. And the reason that Jesus loves us is because he is so great and we are so small. He is great in his love. Let's sing that, that chorus of all four stanzas, number 23, He's So Great. He is so great and I'm so small. Jesus holds me lest I fall. He is the ruler over all. He is so great and I'm so small. He is so strong and I'm so weak. Jesus came his own to seek. All of nature hears him speak. He is so strong and I'm so weak. He is the shepherd. I'm sheep. Jesus guards me while I sleep. All his flock he'll watch and keep. He's the shepherd, I'm his sheep. He's my rock and I'm secure. Jesus lives, my hope is sure. He forever shall rock and I'm secure. Well, I trust that it's been a blessing for us to go through these uh, song, hymns of the months uh, that we've been learning over the years. And then also uh, we've been looking at uh, various verses of the month over the past few months. So we're going to review today. Uh, we'll go over our verse of the month today, but then uh, right now we'll look at a previous verse of the month, from 1 Corinthians 12, verse 7, it says, But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. Would you say that with me, starting with the reference? 1 Corinthians 12, 7. 
But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. And then our current uh, verse of the month that really goes along with our hymn of the month, Psalm 20, verse 7, But some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. Would you say that with me at the reference? Psalm 27. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. Amen. Well, would you stand with me one final time as we sing the song, The Footsteps of Jesus. I trust that that's the the life that you're seeking to have, is following in his footsteps every day. Number 544, we'll sing the first and the fourth verse. Sweetly, Lord, we have heard thee calling, come unto great pleasure to be here this evening, and uh, sorry that the uh, Stevens family have some sickness that necessitated my coming, but it's always good to be, thank you, back home, and in fellowship with you, we get to attend here usually Sunday nights because we're not, uh, we haven't opened up our services out in, out in uh, Coatesville yet, but anyway, it's always good, good to see you. And this morning, I had the privilege of preaching to a diminished crowd, and maybe tonight too, it looks like. By the way, I'm glad I'm far-sighted because I couldn't, can't see some of you, but most of you I can see pretty well back there. Anyway, uh, the COVID virus has escaped our little community up until this past week. We had four families hit by it. Uh, key families, and so we didn't know what to expect this morning, but we, of course, had the doors open and services, so the Sunday school group came in, and that was a a 13-year-old boy and a lady that's always there, but she missed last Sunday because she was uh, quarantined, but she didn't get the virus, but anyway, she was probably 70-something, so we had a, an older lady and a young a teenage boy. That was our, and I, my subject was the, millen, the millennium, uh, just kind of in a series that fell that way. And I thought, well, Jason, that's the boy's name, he's, uh, he's quite a kid. Uh, and I thought he could learn something, and he did. I just kind of a challenge to the teacher to, to make it uh, something that a teenage boy can. And he didn't go to sleep, so I was pleased with that. Uh, sometimes he does lay down, but he didn't do that this morning either, so. Anyway, it was, and then for the Sunday, for the morning service crowd, we had uh, two more come in, a couple, Tony and Patty, and they've longtime members and uh, live in the community. They haven't been touched by it, but so it was like, uh, it, was, it was a good service. And um, I told one of the deacons that had to stay home because he didn't have it, but his, his daughter was, uh, had it and they were quarantined. I said, I, it doesn't matter whether I preach to four or 40 or 400, I just, it's preaching, and uh, the Lord knows, so I'm pleased to be here this evening. Uh, would you take your Bibles and turn to Matthew's Gospel, 
And I know that you have been thinking about uh, Thanksgiving, as all of us have. And we're kind of in a Sunday between Thanksgiving and what we normally begin to think about Christmas and sing Christmas carols and so forth. So I want to just continue the theme of Thanksgiving. I know that uh, I think Thomas preached on that theme this morning, so it doesn't hurt us to think a little bit more about it. And uh, this is how the, what the Lord's laid upon my heart tonight. So kind of a different kind of a message uh, from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 6, which is part of what is known as the Sermon on the Mount. An extended sermon, really, five, chapters 5, 6, and uh, 7 in the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, but a great message. And it's really an interesting thing that in the middle of this long sermon discourse to his disciples, and probably not just the twelve, but a multitude, it says in verse 1 of chapter 5, when, uh, when he went up into a mountain, and when he was said, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying. And then the Beatitudes followed, and, but a lot of other things. It was basically a, a message to Jewish believers, followers of uh, the Messiah, uh, as he came to present his kingdom offer to the nation of Israel, which they rejected. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. They rejected him officially, I think, in Matthew chapter 11, but um, not just then. They pretty much, as a nation, rejected him from the beginning to the end. But some believed and some followed. And so he's laying the uh, foundation for his kingdom. If you uh, accept me as king, it's kind of a uh, his, well, not Magna Carta, but his constitution, if you will. Here's what the kingdom will be like. And uh, here is what those who are in the kingdom will be like. And he said in verse, uh, uh, he said, uh, except your righteousness exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you, ha you will not in any wise enter the kingdom. That's chapter 5, I think. Um, but that's not my message. Chapter 6. So as I start to say, it's, it's interesting he plugged this in, in this uh, extended sermon on the mount. And I want to begin reading with you. In verse 9, after this manner, kind of right there in the middle, now he had been talking about uh, the way to pray, the proper way to pray. Verse 6, go into your closet, don't be as hypocrites who stand in the marketplaces or uh, out in the streets in their long robes and their loud voices. Don't do that. But when you pray, pray, pray to your Father who's in heaven and pray in secret as opposed to going out into the onto the street corner and making a big scene. So maybe with a follow-up on that, he said in verse 9, After this manner, therefore, pray, pray ye, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive you your trespasses. So I want to talk about Thanksgiving. Uh, I'm thankful for so many things as you are. Uh, the list is, uh, is just interminable. It goes on and on and on. So that's not my purpose tonight, but I want to just from this passage, pause to thank God for his hallowed name, uh, for his kingdom that will certainly come as our hope, for his provision of daily bread, and for his forgiveness of sins, and probably some other things. Let me ask you who are, <laughs> most of you have come here sometimes, so I know that uh, I, you've heard this from me before, probably read it. I came across it when I was a kid, I think, but I love it. And Kind of sets the tone for my message. Today up on a bus, I saw a girl, and I know I did this last Thanksgiving. I'll probably do it next if I get a chance to preach here. So, I saw a girl with golden hair. She seemed so gay. I envied her, envied her and wished that I were half so fair. I watched her as she rose to leave and saw her hobble down the aisle. She had one leg and wore a crutch, but as she passed, a smile. Oh, God. Forgive me when I whine. 
I have two legs, the world is mine. Later on, I bought some sweets. The boy who sold them had such charm, I thought I'd stop and talk a while. If I were late, it would do no harm. As we talked, he said, thank you, sir. You've really been so kind. It's nice to talk to folks like you, you see, because I'm blind. Oh, God, forgive me when I whine. I have two eyes. The world is mine. Later, walking down the street, I met a boy with eyes so blue, but he stood and watched the others play. It seemed he did not know what he knew not what to do. I paused, and then I said, why don't you join the others, dear? But he looked straight ahead without a word, and then I knew he couldn't hear. Oh, God, forgive me when I whine. I have two ears. The world is mine. Two legs to take me where I go. Two eyes to see the sunset glow. Two ears to hear all I should know. Oh, God, forgive me when I whine. I'm blessed indeed. The world is mine. Amen. Amen. Father in heaven, I thank you for the abundance of goodness that you bestowed upon us. And we all join in thanking you again today. And we, I pray we will have the spirit of thankfulness tomorrow. And even though the times are hard, and we're living in uncharted waters, most of us. We've never been this way before. Uh, and so we're tested in many, many ways that we've not been accustomed to. We've never been confronted with. So it's a challenge. And we are driven back to the basics to assess what we have, as we just read in the little poem and to be thankful for what we have and also what we don't have. We thank you, Lord, for that. And so bless this message to our hearts. Help us to uh, evaluate and take inventory of whether we have a thankful spirit. And it doesn't seem like as we read this little passage of Scripture, this brief passage of Scripture, that that's the message. But I think the application is that we certainly have so much to be, thank, to be thankful for, for who you are and for what your plan and purposes are. So guide us in our thoughts tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. First of all, I want to say I'm thankful for the hallowed name of God, the name of Jesus, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. The name of Jesus, tis so sweet. I love its music to repeat. Uh, and so many songs, take the name of Jesus with you, child of sorrow and of woe. It will joy and comfort give you. Take it then wherever you go. Precious name, precious name. Well, let me share a couple of verses with you to that end. Psalm 113, verse 2, Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to the going down of the, of the same is the Lord's name to be praised. Ezekiel chapter 36 and verse 23, the prophet said, I will sanctify, God said, I will sanctify my great name. I will sanctify my great name. And then Malachi chapter 1 verse 11, again, similar to what we read in the psalm. For from the rising of the sun, even to the going down of the same, my name shall be great among the Gentiles. And uh, in every place, incense shall be offered unto my name for my name shall be great among the heathen, saith the Lord of hosts. His name is great, great among the heathen, he said. It's going to be great. And wherever the sun comes up, wherever it goes down, worldwide, he's going to have a name that is great. Jesus, oh, how sweet the name. The name of Jesus is so sweet. I love its music to repeat. I said that. There's a name I love to hear. I love to sing its worth. It sounds like music to my ear, the sweetest name on earth. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus because he first loved me. I know of a name, a beautiful name. The angels brought down to earth. They whispered it low one night long ago to a maiden of lowly birth. That beautiful name, that beautiful name from sin has power to free us. That beautiful name, that wonderful name, that matchless name is Jesus. When you think about Jesus, you think about the person of Jesus. 
Uh, back in the 1800s, there were sisters by the name of Anna uh, and Susan Warner, and they wrote, uh, they wrote novels. They were gifted novelists. But Anna wrote a verse to go along with one of the characters of one of the novels that she and her sister had written, and she put it uh, on paper with her pen in 1860 as a poem of comfort to a dying child in one of Susan's stories. And today it is sung by children and by adults, too, around the world. Uh, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. I think that's the name of the song. Uh, but anyway, a seminary, a great theologian visited America, and he was visiting some seminaries of theological learning. And somebody, thought, somebody asked him what was thought to be a very profound question, and they said, Sir, what's the greatest single thought that ever crossed your mind? And you know what he said. He said, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. That's a profound thought, isn't it? <laughs> Jesus loves even me. Jesus loves even me. You know, and again, when you think about the name of Jesus, you wonder, and it's, it's interesting that in the Gospels, there's never a physical uh, characterization of him, uh, never a physical description. I mean, a complete, uh, you know, size, complexion, hair. But when Napoleon was on his march and doing his exploits back in the 1800s. He visited Rome, and he, of course, was, uh, he was a great general. He was out to conquer the world. And while he was in Rome, he took some uh, historical documents uh, from the, uh, the places of in the museums and so forth. One of those documents was written by a, a governor of Judea named Publius Lentulus, he wrote, he lived at the time of Christ, and he was writing back to the emperor. Uh, he was out in Judea, governor of Judea, and he wrote back to the emperor in Rome and said, uh, there's this person named Jesus. He's causing quite a stir. And so it's a contemporary person writing about Jesus to his, uh, to his emperor, just giving him a, an update. I don't know how trustworthy it is, but it's interesting. I'm going to share it with you. Uh, and it was published in the early 1900s in a magazine out of New York. Hasn't gotten wide distri distribution. I haven't seen it uh, lately, and I don't know where I got it from, but I'm going to... In these days, he said, a man named Jesus Christ, who is yet living amongst us and of the Gentiles, is accepted as a prophet of great truth. But his own disciples call him the Son of God. We're thinking about the name of Jesus. His own disciples call him the Son of God. He hath raised the dead and cured all manner of diseases. He's a man of stature, somewhat tall and comely, with a ruddy countenance, such as the beholder may have both, may have both love and fear. His hair is the color of a filbert, which I looked up, not a common name for me, filbert. It's a hazelnut. His hair is the color of filbert when fully ripe, plain to his ear, Whence downward it is more of orient color, curling and waving on his shoulders. In the middle of his head a seam of long hair after the manner of Nazarites. His forehead is plain and delicate, the face without spot or wrinkle, beautiful with a comely red. His nose and mouth are exactly, uh, exactly formed. His beard is the color of his hair and thick, not of any length, but forked. None have seen him laugh. Many have seen him weep. A man for his surpassing beauty, excelling the children of men. That's a quote, direct quote from a historical document taken out of Rome, supposedly written by the governor of Judea at the time of Jesus Christ. Well, his name is above every name. Acts 4.12, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. I hope you're saved tonight. If you're not saved, it's through the name of Jesus. Confess Jesus as Lord. Confess him as Savior. Uh, confess him as the uh, Savior that you need. We all need a Savior. We're all sinners. We come into the world that way. And there's none other name under heaven. Confucius never saved anybody. Buddha never saved anyone. Muhammad never saved one single soul. But Jesus is the Savior of the world. 
Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Well, I'm thankful for his hallowed name. We need to speak it reverently. We need to speak it lovingly. We need to speak it thoughtfully. We need to speak it adoringly. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Secondly, I'm thankful for his kingdom. Notice again in our text tonight, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth or on earth as it is in heaven. So his, he's promised a kingdom. He has a, he has a kingdom. And his kingdom rules over all. Again, let me share with you some verses. Revelation 11, 15. And the angels sounded, and there were, voice, <clears throat> there were great voices in heaven saying, The kingdom of this world, the kingdoms of this world, are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. The kingdoms of, the, I think the song is, Pastor Jeremy referred to it in his prayer, uh, the kingdoms rise and fall. The kingdoms, in Revelation eleven fifteen. the kingdoms, the kingdoms of this world, great kingdoms. <laughs> Some still future yet, I, I, I'm sure. Uh, the kingdoms of this world uh, are going to uh, become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. Revelation 12, 10, now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ, his anointed. Revelation 19, 16, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. And I had my four people this morning say, would you say that with me? Hallelujah, amen. Why? Because the kingdom of the Lord our God omnipotent reigneth. That's gonna be true one of these days. Not today, at least not visibly and, and physically. And materially, but his kingdom will reign forever and ever. Revelation 19, 6, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Psalm 2, 8, and the kingdom and the dominion of the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, whose uh, kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him that was Daniel 7, 27, I believe. Uh, I, I, th I think I want to turn to Revelation chapter 20 and uh, read in verse 6. We could read many other verses. Uh, Revelation 20, blessed, is, blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. That, by the way, is, would be all saved people. Uh, all the saved people. First resurrection. There are mainly two resurrections. I won't go into that tonight, but the resurrection of the just and then Jesus said and of the unjust. So two resurrections. Uh, first resurrection has different phases. Uh, so here he's talking about just the, in general, the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him, class, a thousand years. Wow. We're going to reign with him. We're going to reign with him a thousand years. <laughs> uh, that's hard to visualize. It's hard to imagine. It's hard to get a hold of. Jesus shall reign where'er the sun doth his successive journeys run. His kingdom stretch from shore to shore till moons shall wax and wane no more. To him shall endless prayer be made and praises throng to crown his head. His name like sweet perfume shall rise with every morning sacrifice. People and realms of every tongue dwell on his love with sweetest songs and infant voices shall proclaim the early, their early blessings on his name. Blessings abound where'er he reigns. The prisoner leaps to lose his chains. The weary finds eternal rest and all the sons of want are blessed. By the way, this is Isaac Watts who was bored with the music of his day in his church, his state church, and he was his father sensed it on the way home and said, what's the matter, Isaac? He said, oh, found out that but the little probing, the music just didn't do anything for him. So he said, well, write some. He did. This is one of them. Last verse, let every creature rise and bring peculiar honors to our king and angels descend with songs again and earth repeat the loud amen. Jesus shall reign. What a kingdom. What a kingdom of glory it's going to be. Uh, somebody asked Napoleon again, I got to go back. And they said, Napoleon, Napoleon and this is after he his, had reached his zenith of power. They said, he, who's the greatest warrior the world has ever known? By the way, 
recently in the campaign, I think somebody asked President Trump, who's the most powerful man in the world? And they thought he would say, you know, in his humility, they thought he would, but they, he, he didn't. He said, uh, God, or I don't think he said Jesus, but he pointed upward and, and it indicated that he thought God was. Well, Napoleon, this person who asked the question, figured he would say, he would say, I am the most powerful person in the world. I have been, but he said, without hesitation, he said, Jesus Christ. But his friend said, you've not always talked that way. When you were winning battles, even up to the very time of Waterloo, you left the impression that you were the world's greatest warrior. This is how Napoleon replied, yes, I have all, always acted as though I thought I was the world's greatest conqueror. I've had lots of time to think about it since I've been here on this island. He was exiled to uh, the island of St. Helena, where he had a lot of time to think about it. Uh, he said, since I've been on this island, the Caesars, the Caesars, Alexander the Great, Hannibal, Charlemagne, and myself, we have fought with blood and tears uh, and swords and iron, and we lost, all of us lost. We lost our scepters, our crowns, our offices. The only sword Christ had was a broken reed. His crown was some twisted thorns. His army, a band of fishermen and farmers. His ammunition, a heart of redeeming love. He lives, and I and my kind die. I stand here and call for the old guard to come, but they do not hear me, Napoleon said. There's no responding voices. My old soldiers do not hear my voice. I hear nothing but the waves, and they bite at the rock beneath my feet. But after 1,800 years have gone into the tomb of time, Christ calls men, calls and men answer. If, I need, if need be, they give their bodies to be burned. If need be, they follow him into the heart of Africa. But better still, they live patient and triumphant lives in peace. In, in the patient and in peace, he said, the other warriors and I will ride down to the dust, but Christ will live forever. Pretty profound words from somebody that had a lot of time to think about it. The kingdom of God is going to be universal someday when he's going to reign wherever the sun doth its successive journeys run. Let's go to the next point. Thank God for his hallowed name. Thank God for his kingdom that will come. Thank, I thank God for, notice what, God, what Jesus said. Give us this day our daily bread. And by the way, in Matthew 7, 7, he said, Ask and it shall be given to you. Uh, he is more anxious to give than we are to ask on most occasions. In 1 Timothy 6, 8, Paul said, Having food and raiment, let us therewith be content. And God has given us, my, we, I don't know about you, but it's almost embarrassing sometimes to see what the table is spread and we've got a, another moment coming up, thank uh, Christmas, and the, all the abundance of gifts and pre precious things. Proverbs 30, verse 8. I had a man in my church in Wichita, Kansas. He was uh, in the Air Force, young man. Uh, he and his wife were just uh, starting out in marriage. And this was his, he shared with me one day, this is my life verse, Pastor. Young, 19, 20-year-old man. Proverbs 30, verse 8, Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with food convenient for me, lest I be full and deny thee, and say, Who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and take the name of my God in vain. Pretty good uh, life principle to live by. Psalm 34, 10, The young lions do lack and suffer hunger, but they that seek the Lord shall not want any good thing. And you know what David said, I have been young and now I'm old and I've never seen the seed of the righteous begging bread. Uh, Job said in Job 23, I have esteemed the word of his mouth more than my necessary food. And Jesus said in John 4, my meat is to do the will of of him that sent me. He gives us our daily bread. Does he? Think of the, the children of Israel back out in the, in the wilderness. Uh, 
they had pretty crude means wherewith to provide daily bread. And so, you know what God did. He gave them manna, uh, heavenly biscuits, kind of like my wife makes once in a while. Wonderful wafers of sustaining food. And all they had to do was out and pick it up every day. Uh, enough on the, on the sixth day to last the Sabbath. So what a great God. They wanted some meat, so what did he do? He sent a, a, a mighty storm that brought in quail up to their knees as far as they could see on either side, either direction. So they had, all they had to do was, you want meat? Here, I'm going to give you, it's, it's going to come out of your nostrils eventually. You're going to get meat and meat and meat and meat. So be careful what you ask for. But they got food. They got, and, and you need water? Well, there's a rock, and uh, out of the rock came water. God's so, so good. My wife has been lamenting because it might have been here, but we haven't been able to sing as a group, with a group at least, her favorite Thanksgiving song. So I'm going to share it with her tonight, and you can listen in. Thanks to God for my Redeemer. Thanks for all thou dost provide. Thanks for times now but a memory. Thanks for Jesus by my side. Thanks for prayers that thou hast answered. Thanks for what thou dost deny. Thanks for storms that I have weathered. Thanks for all thou dost supply. If time tarries, I suppose, and I pray and I hope, and you do too, that uh, this worldwide pandemic of flu will be a memory and we will have weathered it. But we know one thing, God will supply our needs according to his riches and glory. That little 13-year-old boy this morning and right down there two rows from me, I said, Jason, you're young, you're, you got your life, and God's going to supply all of your needs. Just trust him. Now, I have been young like he, <laughs> and I'm old like David said he was. And I can tell you, I've never seen the seed of the righteous begging bread. He does supply. He does supply generously. I've been in very humble places. I think of Cuba, way out from Havana, way out in the sticks, way out in the boonies, as it were, a little shack that we would not want to call a home or a house, a little shack that Brother Collins Glenn and I were sitting down with uh, an evangelist. Uh, we were there on a preaching tour, and they had chicken that they served us it was the skinniest little chicken you ever did see. But I was humble to eat it. Humble to eat it. They put their best out. They'd saved for, no, no doubt, for a long time to, to be uh, kind to these preachers that were traveling. But he provided way out there in such a humble way. I could tell other stories, but I won't. Thanks for roses by the wayside. Thanks for thorns. Their stems contain thanks for home and thanks for fireside. Thanks for hope, that sweet refrain. Thanks for joy and thanks for sorrow. Thanks for heavenly peace with thee. Thanks for hope in thy tomorrow. Thanks through all eternity. We've got so much to be thankful for. You know, King David wanted to build the temple, but God said, David, uh, I'm not going to let you do that. War has been in your house. We'll be in your house, continue to be in your house. I'm going, to, I'm going to let your son build the temple. David accepted that. But before he died, David began to amass the materials that would be needed to build the temple. It says in 1 Chronicles chapter 29 that he gave 3,000 talents of gold toward the project and 7,000 talents of silver. <laughs> now, computed by today's standard, that would be over $6 billion dollars. He gave, that's just part of what he gave. And the leaders of the nation followed his example and contributed a great deal too. David said in 29, 1 Chronicles 29, 14, Who am I and who are my people that we should be able to offer so willingly as this? For all things come from you. And of your own we have been, we have given you. Of your own, listen, he said, and of your own we have given you. In other words, all of this is yours, God. We just gave it back to you. 
I hope you're a tither. I hope you give regularly to the work of God. Oh, when we take, when we receive the offering, it was always my uh, custom to say we're going to receive the Lord's offering. It is His offering. Amen. Amen. You're not giving Him anything of your own. You're giving Him what is His. He's given it to you to administer and to uh, be a steward of. But what a great example uh, that David's first words, 1 Chronicles 29.10, Blessed are you, Lord, God of Israel, our Father, forever and ever. Blessed are you, Lord, God of Israel, forever and ever. He's a great God. He gives us our daily needs. Somebody said there is a correlation a significant, a significant correlation between healthy bodies and grateful hearts. I don't know if that can be proven scientifically, but I, I have a feeling that there's probably some truth in that. <laughs> if you've got a grateful heart, you're going to have, a, I think, a more healthy body. You know, some people you're in the presence of, and, and they just begin at the first opportunity to talk about their ills and their ailments and their <laughs> their problems uh, they just we just need to focus on God's grace his goodness as David did and and uh, others of of his kind I like the uh, illustration somebody used of an evergreen tree despite the changes in weather around it it's evergreen it's green in the heat of the summer as well as in the cold of the winter so lives, so our lives ought to be characterized by a, a regular, steady testimony of praising God for His goodness. We ought to be, we ought to be full of praise in the hard times as well as in the uh, not so as well as in the good times. Well, one more thing, one more thought from our text tonight. At least one more, and I think I'll just do the one. Verse 12, and forgive us our debts. By the way, if you turn to Luke uh, chapter, I think it's chapter 11. Let me check it out with you. Luke chapter 11, verse 4, parallel passage. Uh, it's, it's quoted this way. Luke 11, in verse 3, it says, give us day by day our daily bread. So this is Luke's rendition of that part of the Sermon on the Mount that Jesus preached. Uh, and then in the next verse, and forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone that is indebted to us or has sinned against us, and lead us not to, 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 into temptation, but deliver us from evil. So I want to thank God for forgiveness. Let's go back in Matthew 6 and read that again in this light. And forgive us our trespasses or sins, or as it were here, debts, what we owe. We are debtors to God's grace. We'll never be able to pay, pay him back, but we owe to grace how great a debtor, uh, owe to grace how, what is it, I'm, daily I'm constrained to be. We, are, we just need to be thankful because he forgives us. As we forgive our debtors, and then got to drop down to verse 14 for the follow-up thought, if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. I'm so thankful for his forgiveness. Isaiah chapter 43, verse 25 says, uh, I, even I, am he that blotteth out transgressions for my own sake and will, and will, re, and will not remember thy sins. Let me read that again. Let me show you. Isaiah 43, 20. God, God is speaking. I, even I, am he that blotteth out. It's like an ink blotter. It's like a, a, something that ink is over and you can't see through it at all. It's, he says, I blot out transgressions for my own sake and will not remember your sins. Psalm 103, 3, who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases. Isaiah 44, 22, I have blotted out as a thick cloud thy transgressions, and as a thick cloud thy sins, God said. I have blotted them out. I know you probably resurrect them in your mind, and sometimes as we're walking through life and our Christian journey, 
everything's going well, and all of a sudden we were confronted with one of the devils that's out there, and there are many of them, and they've got some old sin out of our closet, and they're shaking, they're rattling our cage with it. Hey, yeah, 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 yeah. You, you think, you know why God isn't answering your prayers, don't you? Remember what you did back there? Remember what? Remember that uh, that transgression? Remember what you stole? Remember what you took? Remember what you said against that person? And so he'll rattle that sin in front of us in our minds and shake us. And so our walk for the Lord, it's hindered. It stops maybe temporarily as we as we're confronted by Satan bringing up those old things out of the past, trying to defeat us, trying to think God won't forgive you. Why do you think God would forgive you? Well, here's the reason. Latch on to it. Isaiah 44, 22. I have blotted out as a thick cloud. You cannot see through it. The sun's there. But I blot out like a thick cloud thy transgressions and as a thick cloud thy sins. And then he says in the next part of the verse, return to me. Return to me, for I have redeemed you. So you just say, well, God, thank you. I remember what it says in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, you're faithful and just forget, and if cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I confess that, oh, God, please forgive me. Wash me, purge me, cleanse me. Thank you, Lord. And that sin's blotted out, and you keep on walking for Christ. Amen. Amen. On your Christian journey. Get a hold of it. Hang on to it. Isaiah 55, 7, let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy on him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. We could read many other verses. Jeremiah 31, 34, I will forgive their iniquity. I will remember their sins no more. Micah 7, verses 18 to 19, who is a God like unto thee? that pardoneth iniquity and passeth by the transgressions of the, uh, of the remnant of his heritage. He retaineth not his anger forever, because he delighteth in mercy. He will turn. He will turn again. He will have compassion upon us. He will subdue our iniquities. And thou wilt cast their sins into the depths of the sea. Glory to God. What a wonderful Savior. What a great Redeemer. He says on the basis of, of this, turn, turn, come back. Don't let Satan get you down. In fact, uh, he said, we'll not develop it, but lead us not to temptation, deliver us from evil. Uh, so when you are tempted to quit... <laughs> when you come to that place where Satan rattles you, do what Jesus did. It was near the end of his ministry to his disciples. He just said, I'm going to build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And moments later, he said, and by the way, he said, I'm going to go to Calvary. I'm going to die and I'm going to be uh, buried. I'll, I'll come again after three days and three nights. And then Peter pulled him aside and said, Oh, Jesus, don't, don't, don't talk about that. You, you, don't, you don't want to die. You don't have to die. And you remember what, remember what uh, Jesus said? He said, uh, in fact, Peter said, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. You're Messiah. And Jesus said, Get thee behind me, Satan. Get thee behind me, Satan. He quoted the word of God. Delivers from evil. He does. He has. He will. Just like he, he did Jesus in the garden when he was tempted in the wilderness, having been tempted uh, and fasting 40 days and 40 nights. And the devil said, if you are the son of God, turn that stone into bread. And Jesus said, thou shalt not. The, the, the word of God says, thou shalt not live by bread alone. We're quoted the word. We can resist the devil. But my point here is... Uh, we are forgiven our transgressions. What a great passage. So therefore, and this is in conclusion, by the way, therefore we ought to be quick to forgive other people. And it's staggering. It's staggering. 
the offenses that man has perpetrated on the man, fathers on the children, it breaks your heart. We haven't even heard half the stories, I'm sure. We don't want to hear them. The sins of humanity against humanity, the wretchedness, the awfulness, parents to children, children to parents, brothers to sisters, and fights and fusses and battles that are ongoing year after year and, and the flesh and blood squared off against flesh and blood with unforgiving spirits going to the grave many times with an offense that's never been settled. And I know some of you in any audience, even this size, there have been great offenses. Uh, your spouse left a note one day, said he or she, whichever the case may be, I'm out of here. I'm out of here. And you find out it's another person involved. And you, you live with that. I had that happen, well, many times. But I'm thinking of a couple in, in Newton, Kansas. A man came home from work today and found a note his wife had left and she had left. And uh, it was totally out of the blue. How do you live with that? How do you go on? Well, Jesus forgave us our offenses. He's holy. We offended him. We offended him. And the Bible says, be ye kind, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. He didn't say most of your sins, some of your sins. He said hath forgiven you. He's forgiven you. You can forgive anybody by the grace of God, any sin. That's the way to keep from destroying yourself, by the way. You can live with it. You can hold it in. You can become bitter. You can become shriveled up in your spirit and justify what you're doing and thinking. You can do that, but you need not. You can come to God and say, oh, God, you have forgiven me of my offense. You're a holy God, and I went astray. I rebelled against you, just like Adam and Eve. And I was there in their loins. I did it. They, what they did, I did. That's why I'm a sinner, born a sinner. Oh, God, you have forgiven me, therefore I can, I can forgive. And you can name the transgressor and the transgression. You can do that. And if you don't, if you don't, if you choose not to, and you can choose not to, but know this, if you choose not to, there's no forgiveness for you. Let's read the text, verse 15. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive you your trespasses. That's a somber and sobering statement. We must forgive. We can forgive. We do forgive. Uh, there was a young man who was going to have surgery. He had been diagnosed with a cancer on his tongue. And the doctor said, son, we're going to have to remove that tumor. But we want to tell you this. You're not going to be able to speak uh, intelligibly. It's going to be such a, such a surgery that you will lose your capacity, your ability to, to speak intelligibly. Is there anything you'd like to say before we do the surgery? The young man thought for some time, became very pensive, and the room was quiet, and finally he responded, Thank you, Lord, for enabling me to use my tongue to praise you until now, and I shall continue to thank you with my heart. <laughs> What would, what would your last words be? What, were your, what would your last words be? I hope they be words of thanksgiving and praise for God's hallowed name. Oh, and the hope of his one day universal kingdom. For the daily bread he gives us so abundantly and for forgiveness of sins. Father, thank you so much 
for what you've done for us, for who you are, for the great uh, promises that we have been able to read from your word tonight and be edified by. We are amazed. We are amazed at your goodness to us, so undeserving to our nation, to our churches, and we are suffering tonight as thou knowest, but your grace is sufficient. And in our weakness, your strength will be made perfect. So bless us. Help us to be strong in you and in the power of your might. And help us to have a grateful, thankful, forgiving spirit. For Jesus' sake, I pray. And in his name, amen. God bless you. We're going to close by listening to the song, Thanks to God for My Redeemer, number 202. And then after the the pianist plays through a couple of times, we'll sing just that first verse. I don't know if the words will be on the screen, but if you know it, you can sing out. And if not, you just listen to the words and take this time as a commitment to the Lord to thank Him for all He's done. Thank Him for the forgiveness of sin. Thank Him for our, our meeting our daily needs. Thank Him for our heavenly kingdom that we look forward to and the, and the spiritual kingdom that I trust that you already are a part of as you know Jesus Christ as, as Savior. So as the pianist will play through a time or two, you take this time to thank the Lord. Stand with me as you know and sing as you know that first verse. Thanks to God for my Redeemer. Thanks for all thou dost provide. Thanks for times of memory. Thanks for Jesus by my side. Thanks for pleasant cheer. Thanks to the Lord, our great Redeemer. Well, as you leave tonight, uh, once again, I want to thank you all for coming. And if, uh, if you notice, there are uh, nominations for uh, officer nominations for our church. Uh, if you haven't been able to slip one in the ballot boxes, I believe there's one in the, uh, uh, in the lobby. Uh, so we want to make sure we get those in in a timely fashion. And then don't forget, next Sunday night we have our uh, special business meeting to address a couple of items. And then the week after that, Lord willing, will be our Christmas programs. You are dismissed. <laughs>